webinar as part of the Building Partnerships series. My name is Jo Ingold. I'm an Associate Professor at Leeds University Business School, specialising in human resource management and public policy, and uh, done a lot of work around employment and skills programmes over the last couple of decades. Um, and my particular passion going back at the probably about a decade as business engagement in employment and skills programs and, and it's been my great pleasure to work with with Ursa and the broader employability sector um, on this issue which is um, which is something I really fly the flag for which is why it's, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon um, to to have not only your good selves on the call but also our wonderful lineup of speakers and I'm going to introduce introduce those to you now um, so Ursa this is where webinar is um, part of URSA's webinar series, as I say, part of the Building Partnership series. And today's session is in collaboration with Business in the Community, which is the oldest and largest member-led organisation focused on responsible business, which is fantastic. So it's great, a great pleasure to welcome Katie Deep from Business in the Community today. So welcome, Katie. Thanks for being with us. Katie's head of campaigns um, for focused on, on education. And so Katie will first of all be giving us just a, a, a short um, a short kind of brief and overview of the role of skills um, and I'm going to just say a few words too be before we start um, but I'd also like to welcome our speakers Adam Adesina from the Skills Builder Partnership so welcome Adam great to have you with us um, as I mentioned just in our chat the, before we started there's, we, there's a lot of talk at the moment about Skills Builder I know it's it'll be on the minds of a lot of a lot of people on the call today. So great that you can be with us today to, to talk about, um, about the role of businesses in building, in helping their, um, their employees and their people to build skills and retain skills uh, and think about those, those business benefits and that, that link between um, skills and, um, and organisational resilience, really. Um, but not to, not to kind of tell you what you're going to say, Adam, at all, but it's something that, as you can see, I'm quite quite passionate about. Um, and we also welcome Purvi Patel from um, Heathrow Airport, who previously worked at Business in the Community and is currently Head of Education, Employment and Skills at Heathrow, um, with over 20 years experience of supporting businesses. And, and like Adam has had a lot of, a lot of experience in, in this area, but all, all our speakers bring a wealth of, um, of experience and perspectives today. So um, just by way of introduction, before I pass over to Kate, we I know what on everyone's minds at the moment will be the CARES framework that DWP have commissioned. So thinking a lot about what the current, um, what the current and impending post-COVID context is going to look like for the employability sector and for employment and and, and training and skills. Um, CARES will and, and the the programmes that will follow the framework will be on people's minds um, and, I, and I know that there's a lot of innov innovation being discussed within the sector, a lot of, a lot of debates and, and really healthy discussion I think about, um, about how we can collaborate as a sector uh, which as many people know, uh, know is what's something I'm really passionate about, how we can better work together um, in, to, to help both um, people looking to go into work and stay in work, but also to to help businesses. So for, for me, helping people into work and helping businesses are two sides of the same coin. Um, so, uh, and skills are a really important part of that as well, especially if we're looking at a potential lack of demand within the labour market post COVID. Something that I know is uppermost in a lot of colleagues' minds is how we can keep people skilled, how we can keep them close to the labour market in order to, um, to sort of build that resilience really and be able to to join the labour market once once demand allows but also looking at particular growth sectors and what's happening within sectors in the economy as well. So I, I've said far more probably than I meant to, sorry Katie, so I'm now going to hand over to you um, to talk about the importance of skills and put myself on mute um, and, and just introduce the speakers. Thank you and I'll just hopefully you can all um, see this because there's a couple of slides just for myself and Adam that will hopefully help um, enhance what we're saying. So as, as Joe mentioned, um, BITC is the largest and oldest business led 
a member organization dedicated to responsible business. We have over 750 businesses in membership and we were born some 40 years ago out of the Brixton and, and Toxteth riots really with a mission to uh, basically, if you wanted healthy high streets, you needed to have healthy back streets and the, that group of pioneering business leaders coming together to understand how they could best do that. So fast forward 40 years on um, and, and as this slide kind of articulates, we are still here to try and ensure that we do have those healthy communities and, and today probably more, more than ever. A core part of what we try to deliver with our business and, and what we mobilise those 750 members to do is to create skilled and inclusive workforces for today and also for the future. And at the heart of that for us currently is about ensuring that all individuals with whilst they're in education, but also whilst they're in employment, are able to build their essential skills. So just to introduce the main event, which is very much Adam and, and Porvi, I want to spend a bit of time really um, getting to grips as to why we believe essential skills are ultimately essential. Um, I think that we can all agree that, that now more than ever, um, this idea of the disadvantage gap gap growing is something that we know COVID has has kind of accelerated and we need to act now as a group of businesses to really try and mitigate against this. So we know that from an employment perspective some of the impacts of COVID haven't yet been realised but we know for example that one million young people um, will face unemployment by the end of this this year. We believe that that there is a real opportunity with building essential skills to really ensure that we mitigate against some of some of the more severe impacts of that and that essential skills, whilst not to overplay the hand, are very much an important and under-recognised part of the solution. We know from talking to our members that it that you know it this was an issue that existed pre-COVID um, and actually that lots of our members were saying to us that they had struggled to recruit young people from school or college leavers who had this uh, this group of skills um, that would, would enable them to be successful within their working lives. So we believe there's a really important role that business needs to play in, in building that whilst young people are in education, but also ensuring that they then um, build that through to um, recruitment, but also to the learning and development phases to make sure that people continue to learn and develop these skills because they they aren't things that are innate. They aren't things that, that can't be developed. They are things that you can go on on a progression with. We think that there is an opportunity now as we face forward to whatever the, the next normal will be and to building back responsibly to really put essential skills at the heart of how we drive the recovery period to support individuals as they have to move cross sector, they may be, um, maybe their employer will unfortunately no longer exist, but we know that this suite of skills are highly transferable. They um, they will enable people to be resilient and to be able to move across sectors and also from conversations and research that, that is all out there previously they are skills that um, can't be automated out so action is needed now we believe that there's a real opportunity for essential skills to play a, a pivotal part as we kind of all face forward um, and i will leave it to adam to explain how businesses can get involved and why having a common framework and a common set um, of, uh, of language that builds the bridge between education and employment is so important. Thanks so Thanks much, so Cathy. Much. Um, it's great to be on the line with you all today. Um, I do have a set of slides as well. Thank you, Katie, for uh, being my uh, uh, useful set of second hands for today so I'll just be asking you to click at certain points just to support me in uh, highlighting a few key points that I've got the pleasure of sharing with you all uh, today. By way of quick introduction uh, I'm Adam Head of Employer Advisory here at Skills Builder Partnership and in the short time that I've got with you I wanted to present an overview of the Universal Skills Framework, what it is, why it's important and how employers can engage with it. Uh, and can you just take to the next slide for me? Uh, I thought it would be useful to start with some background. How did we get here, essentially? Um, 
I'm just going to wait for that next slide to come through. Ah, wonderful. Uh, I always have a heart in the mouth moment when I do these kinds of presentations because we never know whether the tech is going to work well, but hopefully we are able to uh, gallop on through. So as I was saying, I wanted to start with some background context as, as to how we got here um, and our reason for existing um, at the Skills Builder Partnership is presented on the screen. We are interested in uh, the same things that all of you on the line are. Essentially, we want to uh, see uh, any of the barriers which stop individuals from accessing and thriving uh, in good work addressed and the specific contribution that we make to that is by helping all individuals build the essential skills they need to succeed. And our starting point really was uh, our experience of the uh, chief, uh, our CEO of the organisation, seeing firsthand that uh, the young people he was teaching in school weren't equipped with those essential skills they needed to succeed and recognising that this was going to stop them from thriving in all aspects of their life, including uh, stopping them from being able to access good quality work. Could I just ask for the next slide, Katie? So as um, we began to consider, uh, you know, what the barriers were that were stopping, um, as, as our CEO began to consider what the barriers were that was stopping his uh, pupils from um, being ready to access those uh, great employment opportunities, we began to really clarify the concept of essential skills and what these mean and why they're important. Um, as presented on the screen, we understand these to be uh, key to supporting people to uh, access uh, good outcomes um, across all aspects of their life. And specifically, uh, we began to realise that actually those essential skills and by essential skills, we mean those highly transferable skills that everybody needs to do to, to perform uh, any job um, can be uh, taught uh, and they can be um, improved upon in a classroom setting. But what became interesting as we gained uh, experience of effectively developing essential skills in young people in a classroom setting is the realisation that actually essential skill development isn't just limited to one context or phase of our lives and it is uh, possible to develop essential skills right the way across your life uh, span and so we began to consider what a consistent approach to building essential skills in education and employment might look like and what benefits that might deliver in terms of supporting people to thrive, not just um, when they're a young person in school, not just in the early stages of their career, but right across their career uh, journey. Could I just ask for the next slide, Katie? So then we began a process of really testing that hypothesis of whether uh, we could introduce a consistent approach to developing essential skills in education and employment and whether or not um, that would deliver the benefits that we uh, thought it would in terms of aligning both education and employment, creating greater transparency in the uh, recruitment process um, and having a common language and common scale on uh, essential skills which supports the upskilling and reskilling of individuals throughout their career history. And so as we tested this hypothesis, we uh, began to uh, get a clearer picture of what these essential skills look like, whether or not they were relevant or um, uh, not for employers. And it became really clear to us that uh, providing a clear picture of these essential skills would deliver, in fact, these benefits um, to both individuals, but also support businesses to uh, make a meaningful contribution to the communities in which they uh, operate and also support uh, their people to grow as they progress across their careers. The end of this process of um, testing this hypothesis was the production of our universal skills framework. Uh, next slide, please. 
which essentially is a presentation of the essential skills which we have tested and recognised now as uh, skills which uh, are relevant and important to businesses and also individuals. And I guess the the, the genius of the um, universal skills framework is the breaking down of each of these skills that you can see on the screen into 16 teachable measurable steps. And there are some really key benefits of uh, doing that. Next slide for me, please. Um, I'll share a bit more about what the framework looks like and the value of the framework to employees in a moment. But I just wanted to touch on what the outputs of the process has been uh, in terms of uh, kind of really testing uh, what the uh, essential skills are and in terms of um, uh, these uh, you know skills that that we need to support um, uh, good uh, good good outcomes across all aspects of our lives and and when we went through this process of really thinking uh, this through we spoke to a number of different stakeholders and produced a set of uh, um, assets and resources which um, have we found have really supported. Uh, individuals and employees to build these essential skills in their people. The journey that we've taken and the evidence presented in the comprehensive report, but we've also produced some key assets which support people to build this stuff. The uh, jewel in the crown, of course, is the universal framework, which, as on the next slide, you can see um, lists all eight of the skills and all of the steps which support people to understand what the knowledge and techniques are of each of the essential skills in that framework um, that was uh, developed through that process of testing. So just by way of quick explanation of the value of this framework to employees, if I could just get the next slide up. Um, you know, we, we recognise that it's useful to know what these essential skills are. It's important to define them and to be able to give people a way to recognise uh, where they are in terms of their um, attainment against this skills framework. But from an employer's point of view, there are some really key benefits of uh, having a universal skills framework presented in this way. In so much as, uh, you know, employers do face a problem of recruiting for essential skills. We uh, recognise across the sector that, uh, you know, um, some of this stuff has particularly been difficult to articulate and therefore measure recruitment processes. My previous background um, in graduate recruitment testifies to this. Um, you know, we, we rely on a gut instinct uh, in some cases when we're thinking about recruiting for uh, notions such as, you know, speaking skills or um, confidence. And the framework really allows us to introduce a degree of validity um, to that process through removing some bias and having an objective measurement that we can assess for the skills against. Of course, uh, the framework will support upskilling and reskilling um, because through having a really clear uh, definition of what great looks like, that employers are then able to support that culture of skill development in their organisation, uh, helping people to understand what their training needs are against these essential skills. And what's been really exciting is seeing the, um, the potential that comes from uh, employers connecting their outreach and their learning and development and recruitment together, because you then are able to uh, uh, build essential skills in the future workforce and not just in the current workforce. And that's when we really do see um, uh, a game change in terms of essential skills being open and available to everyone and uh, everyone being able to take some, um, uh, uh, I guess, ownership and, and uh, ownership of their own uh, uh, skill development through the process. Since we've launched the Universal Framework back in May uh, this year, we've been in 
uh, close conversation with a number of employers and a number of businesses around what the tools and offer is that would really help them to build essential skills in their people. And excitingly, we do have a number of resources and tools which can uh, help employees to build their essential skills in their people today, uh, including our interactive web uh, pages on our website and our uh, guides, which also are on our website. But uh, on the next screen, you'll see that uh, we're actually really interested in uh, collective impact. And by that, we mean we want to engage not just employers, but um, a wider group of stakeholders in this agenda uh, through uh, membership, uh, which will allow uh, everybody in that collective to uh, apply best practice principles to building the essential skills in people and for different stakeholder groups that looks different but uh, in the case of employees we have seen some really exciting examples of employees working um, uh, to build essential skills across both their outreach work in collaboration with skills building organizations and learning and development and recruitment also. So I'll just pause there because I'm mindful that uh, I don't have much time and I'm also conscious that I gabbed through a lot of that, but I'm also keen to um, uh, share the floor with uh, a, a business who has also had a great experience of building essential skills in their people also. So I'll pause there, Katie. <laughs> Are there any burning questions or comments at this point? Otherwise, we'll move to, to Paul V and then we take Q A. Just we've got a question in the chat. No, so I think uh, Paul V, if um, we're going to move on to, uh, to your discussion as well, and your insights along with Katie that would be fantastic at this point. Great thank you um, so as Joe said earlier on I'm Paul Ravi and I'm the head of education employment and skills at Heathrow Airport and my role really is to think about how we can support young people in education and also adults that are in our local community to gain the skills and experience that they need in the workplace we are a people business. Um, our vision is to give passengers the best airport service in the world. And our purpose is to make every journey better. And to make this happen, we need engaged colleagues with the right skills. We have multiple range of sectors that operate across the airport. So there's construction, engineering, airfield operations, retail, hospitality, security, logistics, and that's just to name a few. I think we've got pretty much every sector almost and all roles bar an astronaut probably at Heathrow. It's quite diverse. Um, and each of these businesses, they, they perform a very different function to operate the airport. But at the core of every business and at the core of every role are a set of skills that every business needs. So it doesn't really matter where you work and what role. There'll always be those core few school skills. And I think what we found was that there are a number of different skill frameworks that are available for employers, but it's quite difficult to navigate and quite a crowded landscape when it comes to skills. And I think we felt that the um, essential skills framework that was developed by Skills Builder was using quite simple language that, that we could relate to and that the steps under each of the skill areas that were quite easy to work through and also helps you to sort of identify where you might be along those steps and where you might actually want to get to. Um, we are in the early stages, I think it's probably fair to say, of using the framework, um, but we have started it with our education activity. And we saw an opportunity really that if we develop in new school activities, we have an opportunity to start to think about where this framework could, could add value. And so we use that as a, as a guide, but one of the things I think that we initially observed is that there were eight skill areas we felt might be too much to incorporate into school activities and work with teachers on. So we took the key elements that we felt were most important to us as a business. Um, and they were communication, which is your listening and speaking skills that are in the framework, the creative thinking and problem solving, which is self-explanatory and again within the framework, 
team working we focused on rather than leadership. And then adaptability was the word that we used um, that refers to the sort of the self-management um, that's in the framework. So they were the five that we sort of worked to. And the activity that we were asking the young people to work on was actually designing a terminal lounge that would reflect the different mega trends of the future and therefore designing the right passenger services for our business. So that kind of an activity lent itself to doing a lot of the problem solving and the creative thinking, working as a team and obviously the communication side of things. And to help us understand whether or not the young people were actually developing these skills or having an opportunity to experience those skills, um, they filled in some evaluation forms and we talked to the teachers as well. And the skill areas that they felt that were most developed through those activities were probably the first four, um, the, the communication, creative thinking, problem solving and team working, but not anything around adaptability. But I suppose the activity didn't really lend itself to that. Um, we did also provide teachers with some pre-activity sheets that were specifically around the skills builder framework, but that was quite hit and miss. Some of the feedback that we had with te from teachers is that they didn't necessarily have the capacity to do the pre-activity. Um, and then our own observations of the activity and the feedback is that I think we were probably trying to do too much. We were perhaps trying to shoehorn too many of the skills into the activity. So I think in terms of restarting those activities when we're able to from September, October time, I think what we want to do is to, to review that a little bit and maybe just focus in on two or three key skills um, so that the young people can have a, a, a greater experience of those. And I also think probably one of the other things that we would do going forward now as we don't design new activities is maybe to think about the skill areas and then what school activities might draw out those skill activities. I think what we did was we had an activity in mind and then we thought, well, which skill areas would we draw out from those particular activities? So I think we would probably switch that round now going forward when we deliver others. Um, we also have a work experience program at Heathrow and we introduced the framework to the work experience hosts. But what we didn't have was necessarily a structured way of using the tool for the five day program. So we asked some f uh, feedback from the students and we also had and I noticed that Bella is on the call as well today and Bella came in and met one of our work experience students and taking feedback from the students and some guidance from Bella at Skills Builder is that we should introduce the framework at the start of the work experience week so they get an idea of all of it and then drawing out examples of what would um, aligned to those particular skills, what task would develop those skills. Um, and then we would have a one to one with the students and ask which particular skill area does that student want to actually focus on for that week? And it might be something that they think they're good at and want to develop more and actually be able to practice that in the workplace. Or it could be a new skill area, something that they're less confident about or something that they haven't tried. But that's the sort of thing that we plan now to move forward with. We are obviously, like most employers, looking at delivering it uh, virtually going forward for a while, just in terms of some of the restrictions that are in place at the moment. So we just need to think about how we would uh, manage to do that. We're also starting to work with our college partners, local to Heathrow, um, on a collaborative programme of developing some quality content um, that young people can really engage on. And this would be for 16 to um, 24 year olds or 16 to 19 in the main, but can support some of the older students. And again, we're going to be designing those activities and content using the Skills Builder framework. So it's there from the outset. Since the framework has been updated to include all ages, we've now actually just started to prepare how we can include the framework into the pre-employment training programme that we run for our local community. So these are local residents to Heathrow that come on our pre-employment training programme that we manage through the Employment and Skills Academy that we have. Um, and it's about supporting them to get the key employability skills. So we support them with communication, motivation. We do some team building exercises with them. We support them to update their CV, understand what skills they can put on the CV. We do interview skills and uh, preparation with them and then support them around the job brokerage side of things. But this is now an ideal time actually for us to review the pre-employment training programme given the current climate and actually start to think about how that framework could add greater value to those individuals. So what we want to do is to start embedding that into it. 
So again, I think we probably think that the eight skill areas and the 16 steps under each would probably be quite a lot to, to go through. So we're looking at those skills pairs that have now been introduced and actually how we might be able to incorporate some of our content across those skills pairs. So we're in the early parts of that. We haven't actually rolled out the pre-employment training with that new framework yet. The plan is to do that from September. Um, but the feedback that we've had from the two trainers that um, Adam and Bella presented to a few weeks ago has been really positive. And the other thing that they're doing is looking at um, a bit of a self-assessment at the beginning of the pre-employment training using the framework to get a sense of where those candidates might already be in that skill area, what step they might already be starting at and actually what step do they want to get to so that we can think about what's the most appropriate way of supporting them to get to that point. So they're the things that are in motion for planning and probably hoping to roll out from September. We're getting quite a bit of feedback from employers across Team Heathrow, who we refer to as Team Heathrow. Um, they've got a number of colleagues, obviously, that are coming back off furlough at the moment, and they're likely to return to different roles, a different working environment and an agile working culture. So this is a sort of a different to things that they've experienced before. So the feedback from them is also that actually they think that the essential skills framework is probably going to be heightened. The need for it will be heightened and we need to have a bit more of a focus on that. So uh, we introduced it. So Nicola Inge from Business in the Community a couple of weeks ago presented the essential skills framework to our People Leadership Forum. The People Leadership Forum is a network of 45 of the largest companies that operate at Heathrow. It's made up of group HR directors or equivalents in terms of the people function. And it was received positively. And there's a few companies there that want to explore how they can better use that framework and, and embed it into their work. So that's the next action that we're actually taking as well. And in terms of the, the passengers and the linkage to, you know, why are we using the, the framework as well is that our passengers now, current climate, you know, Katie gave a picture of the sort of, the, you know, the COVID-19 situation. Our passengers are going to be seeing a very different Heathrow to the one that they've actually seen before. You know, there are social distancing guidelines in place. There will be instructions about where you walk, where you stand, the washing of the hands. It's a very different experience, really. Um, and the focus for us, obviously, is keeping everybody safe. And airports, at the best of times, can be places of anxiety for some people. And I think given the current climate, it's probably a place of an anxiety for most people, not just those that might historically suffer from anxiety. And I think the question on their mind is, will, will I be safe coming through, traveling through Heathrow? And we need to be able to make sure that those passengers feel safe, that their well-being is being looked after. We have people passengers from all over the world with multiple languages. So the ability to be able to communicate effectively Poor you've poor just got yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Oh, we can hear you. Could you not hear me throughout the all of just, that? No, it just suddenly went off. We didn't miss much at all. Oh, sorry. What happened? Where did I get to? So passengers and feeling safe yeah so you didn't miss too much at all then no so no passengers coming through a very different environment to what they would have experienced before so it's just making sure that our colleagues mm. have got the the skills and the tools to be able to effectively communicate to answer the questions that passengers might have and actually you know be able to listen to what they're saying and, and direct them in the right way so again that framework just makes it more relevant to us as a business and why we would be using it. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that, you know, for us, we found the framework quite an easy tool to use. And I think it's probably a tool that you can use at any level of the organization. Um, it's not just for if you're in an entry point role. And I think sometimes there can be those misconceptions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter what level you're at. There is a step there for you to be able to develop and grow into. Um, so I think really it, it, it's, it's working for us. We're, we are at the early stages. We see real value in doing this. We're doing it in phases. So we've started in terms of the education activity and we'll continue to do that. 
We're now looking at the pre-employment training for our candidates. We're now working with our Team Heathrow employers and seeing how we can do that. And then there's also the Heathrow Airport Limited pieces, us as the airport operator and how we might as well look at how we build in that framework into our work. And, and the rationale, I guess, for us using this is that it helps us to equip our colleagues across the whole of the airport to give the best passenger airport service in the world. And, and that's really what we're about. So that's, I'll stop there. And apologies that suddenly I seem to have gone on mute. <laughs> It's a tall boy. I think we're all coping with uh, different challenges with the technology and connections or whatever, aren't we? So that was really fantastic. Thank you so, so much. A number of questions popped up into my mind, which, um, and I know we're starting to get a few on the chat as well, but I will I will just pause on those at the moment. And I'd like to hand over to Katie um, to give some reflections as well, but to what we've heard from Porvi, but also in terms of where business has its perspective in terms of this building of essential skills agenda. Thank you, Joe. And hopefully I can um, capture it. I lost you slightly in that. Um, and I'm, I'm very... sorry, am I disappearing? I think I got the gist, so don't, don't worry. Um, and I'm very conscious of time and really want um, really to hand over to everyone who, who's dialed in to, to ask questions. So I won't go into to depth with this, but, but we thought it would be helpful to kind of put it in context and give kind of other examples building on the on the fantastic example um, that Paul B has obviously given from a Heathrow perspective. What you can see in front of you now is, is BITC's employment framework. It was um, produced as part of the Future Proof campaign, which came out of the, the previous recession, really to focus around um, employment of, of young people. And there were three elements to it, as you can see in that little diagram, inspire, hire and grow. As a response to COVID, we've added um, a new word, protect, which for us is, is very much about um, focusing on ensuring that businesses are monitoring the impact um, that their decisions say around furlough or redundancies will will have on young people and we are calling um, for businesses to kind of monitor that and, and report against it as they would with with other characteristics. In terms of inspire, hire and grow, I think it would be good to kind of map together um, obviously Adam's presentation and also um, what Paul v had, had fed back to us in the sense of we are working um, with our businesses to understand how they can embed essential skills across the employment journey. So that is everything from pre-employment, their education and community programs, um, which would, I guess, in this instance, fall under Inspire, which Paul V spoke so well about in terms of their education programs. But we've also got companies like KPMG who have embedded it um, in, in both their education programs, but also now in their kind of uh, level three apprenticeship programs. So they are working with that cohort of young people, um, running workshops all around essential skills to support them to achieve their endpoint assessment standards um, by building the, these skills. We have then uh, worked with companies who are really looking at it, as, as Paul V is alluding to, companies are coming to the framework and really saying, OK, what is the right entry point for us? Um, they, they often get quite excited and kind of think, oh, we can boil the ocean and embed this across everything from our kind of leadership programs through to, uh, to our pre-recruitment, but actually boiling down to where can they have the greatest impact. So on, on some of those higher examples, we have very closely been working with companies like Boots, who again have have looked at how they go into recruitment, the, the language that they use, how can they simplify that? Um, and again, specifically looking at their apprenticeship cohort, they have um, changed their recruitment packs. They've embedded the language of essential skills within that. They have also then, when, when people apply for an apprenticeship there, they're sending out information about essential skills and how you can demonstrate that you have achieved them so that actually their recruitment process is therefore more transparent and everyone is starting at, at the same same level. So, um, so that's something that they have started to embed and are, are seeing some real impact and going forward that they're going to see once they have hired those apprentices, how can you um, help them to identify where maybe they have got gaps in some of those skills, but how through the apprenticeship they, they could build them. And then fourth and, and 
on on this slide really is is that idea of of grow and as as Paul V was sort of saying, um, this is about continuous learning and development and how do you support people once they're in work to continue to to develop their essential skills and we've got organisations like Tideway who are looking through things like their volunteering programmes to support volunteers to map where they are on their essential skills journey to understand through the volunteering opportunities that Tideway offer, how they might be able to build those essential skills and then ultimately how that could in the long run tie into um, perhaps their appraisal system in terms of both supporting people um, when it is, when those skills have been identified as, as a kind of learning and development area, but also understanding that Tideway as an organisation has an end point and actually how can they support people to develop these skills, understand that they're transferable and how they can map possibly into their, um, their next job or role um, on a different project once Tideway kind of wraps up. So I guess we just wanted the opportunity to, to tie in some of those um, broader examples and really bring the, the framework to life, but also tie it back to how we believe this can really help rebuild the workforce post COVID. But I'm, I really want people to have the opportunity to ask those burning questions. So over to that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you again, Porvi and Adam as well for fantastic, um, fant fantastic pieces there that illustrating the different L aspects really in perspectives so um question from david thomas porvi how do you assess students starting positions and distance travel and also doing the same thing um I've, david would you like a question you break up a little bit joe but i think the question to me is how do we assess how the students are doing on their skills is that right yeah that's right yes and but also yeah so the sort of starting point and how yeah. much further they've moved it's actually it's, um we're at the really early parts of this what we've managed to do was to do a few activities um to try and test it a little bit um and then obviously most of this year unfortunately we've not been able to continue with the education activities simply because of the current situation so i think what we would want to do is probably sit down and work with the teachers on how the best way we would be able to assess that distance travelled. I think it's probably going to be easier for us to do it with our pre-employment training candidates, the, the adults on our programme, because already the teachers have said that the capacity for them to really be able to do it with young people is going to be quite tight. Um, if there's any examples out there of how others have succeeded in that, I'd be really appreciative. So I think pre-employment training programme, we will be able to measure distance travel because we're going to be work doing a self-assessment with the candidates at the beginning of the programme and then at the end of the programme to see how far they have come. Um, and then also our work experience programme, we would hope that we'd be able to fo focus in on one or two skill areas. But it is an area we still need to, to develop further. It's not something we've bottomed out completely because we are still quite early on. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. I have, sorry, I just had to move then to try and get a better Thanks. connection. Um, D David, did you want to come in there at all in, in respect of your question? And that's the bit that missed out b uh, before when my internet dropped out. Uh, hi, thank you very yeah. much for that, uh, the opportunity to talk. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, I think it's all about stuff because I looked at it on the website. There's quite a lot of steps. There's a mm. lot of skills there. So I was a bit daunted by how yeah. to begin the process, but I suppose a self-assessment on a simple way and building from that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the, the way that we, we're doing it with the pre-employment training is um, looking at what do we need as the business, what might be the skill areas, and what do we think is appropriate to be working with the candidates on, and then pulling out some of those key steps. So we won't be doing all 16 steps because I think it is probably too much. And, you know, there are other things we need to cover up on the training as well. So it's, I think it's just about what's right for you as a business and what's going to work for those candidates and bringing those two together. Wonderful. Lee, do you have anything to um, that you wanted to add? No, not really. I totally agree. It's really difficult. It is rather overwhelming when you first look at them all and each of the levels. And I started looking at them as 
as if level one was equal to sort of like a year one because when we first started talking about it with skills builder I was looking at it as a primary from a primary perspective so that if students started on it at primary level by the time they got to secondary they were sort of on the on the level six within each I don't know what they call it sorry Adam you'll need to step in and tell me what you call each strand um but actually the more you look at it with adult learners as well some adult learners that I've worked with are actually at a level one and level two so I don't think it's that it, it necessarily links with an age of learning it, it's that you could be really high up and really strong in your communication but it might be that you're not so strong with your team leadership so that I think once you start using the toolkit it becomes easier but it's, it is very overwhelming when you first look at it and I think you're right you're it's probably better just to drill down get that information from the employer that you're working with and say shall we just concentrate on the communication the talking the presenting side which your evidencing is a skills gap for you and just work through those first because I think if you try and do all of them it probably is a bit overwhelming Adam did you want to come in there oh. I did, yeah, I just had a quick thought. Sorry, I didn't want to run over mm -hmm. anybody there, but um, I guess one of the uh, useful features of the framework and the way that the steps have been broken down into skill steps is that there are um, themes across certain skill steps. So you'll see when you take a look at the framework, um, it, the steps are kind of grouped into uh, kind of thematic development stages. And essentially, each of these skill steps should build on one another. So it makes total sense, of course, that um, you know, there might be a point in uh, somebody's career journey where, for example, they're looking at uh, a progression opportunity and the next um, level of mastery of that particular skill would require them to take that next um, next jump up in terms of proficiency with those with that skill. And that would require them to be able to perform certain skill steps which are higher than the next. And so we have seen in our experience of working with employers, um, particularly employers thinking about, um, you know, at what point do does an individual need to be able to perform these groups of skill steps and what other points um, might these be more um, more frequently used? And that has helped some uh, individuals, employers really think about, um, I guess, what a target skill steps looks like for them. So Adam, how sort of how long do you think it takes when you're working with a client? So you've gone and spoken with the employer, they've identified that there's a particular skills gap that they know within their within their workforce is sort of missing or it, it's not as strong as they would like it to be. Mm -hmm. How long do you think you need to take with a with a participant then to kind of ascertain where they are on on each of the levels? Do, you know are you able is there sort of like a tool that you sit down with the client and, and ask them a number of questions like how to how do you map that it's a good question and we've seen there's been a couple of different approaches that have been taken so uh, you know the way that the, the framework is built allows for uh, a subjective reflection essentially you know it's about that person looking at that framework and really thinking where is where am i on this framework and as we've yeah. seen some approaches has been uh, about focusing in on one or two skills or skills pairs um, but I guess my advice would be to uh, you know we want to communicate the message that all eight of these skills are essential but uh, in some contexts and for some roles you might be using some particular skills and some particular skill steps more frequently than others and that for that will be the focus of what you might reflect on uh, and that might look like a individual really thinking about how frequently they use a particular skill step in that role or in that context to support um, a reflective conversation just on one or two skills or one or two uh, areas of reflection. Um, we don't yet have a kind of uh, reflection uh, tool but what we do have is the interactive framework um, which allows for people to really dig down into the, the uh, skill steps and view uh, what they look like in uh, practice because they've got some uh, really helpful descriptors of what the knowledge and techniques are for each of those skills.
Mm. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks, Adam. That's really helpful. Um, David, can I just, um, I'd like to bring you in there, followed by um, Suzanne and then and then Jessica. Um, so David, does, does that help you as a kind of, as a newbie thinking of getting started as you, you nicely put that? Yes. Uh, yeah, Joe, very much. Um, and I can definitely see a, a use for this within our, not only our company for, for working with staff, but also working with our apprentices and the community support we deliver to mm. employers. Um, is there, I mean, bearing in mind so much of a shift into online and digital these days, uh, is this, um, is that part of the skill set that's included? Is there a step around sort of digital enablement that people need to have as an essential? That's, I'm wondering, I couldn't see that in the steps. I haven't had a good look at them, I'm, I'm afraid. Thanks, David, Adam. Uh, yeah, I can take that. I think you raise a really interesting point. Um, I guess when we went through this exercise, we were trying to distill down what were the uh, essential skills which support people to apply perhaps more technical skills that they might need to use in their roles. And so there was a, 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 a discussion and some reflection on what the distinction was between these kind of essential skills as we saw them in digital skills. Um, to answer your question specifically, we don't have a uh, digital skills aren't included in this framework, but of course they are a prerequisite for you know being really effective in the workplace. And so um, uh, that's we, that's not included in this framework. But of course there are so many uh, frameworks out there which I think can support people to um, gain those digital or technical skills, um, which relate to using digital technology and um, to support them in their work. OK, thanks, Adam. Um, Suzanne, could I bring you in here, please? Would you like to say something just about um, the person centred aspects or do you feel that that's been covered off? I think it was just making a point around kind of person centredness. And uh, although you've got a kind of standard skill builder framework, it's making sure that the, the way I, we deliver support is around that personalised action plan so it's identifying those individual goals as well that works alongside any skill builder around the individual barriers and um, obviously we've worked with people with autism and learning difficulties so it's got to be around kind of what they want from that and they've got to be able to buy into what you're doing and particularly looking at the placement so you're kind of looking at a Heathrow placement scheme so making sure that whatever the placement's geared around is kind of building the skills but also building the kind of personal goals that they want to achieve from that I think if it's not got a personal purpose to it, the people are going to struggle to buy in and get what they need from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it definitely makes sense to me in terms of, um, and I think it, uh, the, um, the panellists too, in terms of um, bringing together those, the kind of supply and demand side elements, if you like, the sort of two sides of that and and, and having that balance. Um, and yeah, and, and you raised really important points about people who are, uh, neurodiverse and also as we know people um, with learning disabilities who are massively massively underrepresented in the labour market so I know um, you do great work there. Um, Jess could I bring you in here and he wanted to um, to say something. Thank you very much yeah I work alongside Katie um, at Business in the Community and have been involved in <laughs> Skills Builder for a little while now so I was just just really wanted to say that it's really exciting to have this discussion not only with employers in the room but also with the organizations that are supporting people into employment and um, that's why we were so pleased to partner with Ursa for this event and just to really make that relevant to you guys I guess Katie talked about uh, the different employers who are now looking at Skills Builder who are incorporating those skills into their programs and into the way that they hire and so as the labor market is moving and changing um, really key that the organisations that are supporting people who are looking for work, who are out of work or who are trying to potentially even progress in work are uh, um, uh, talking with that same language and so that importance of the common language and getting candidates to understand that they have those skills even if they're going for something that might be different to the sort of job they've done before that those skills are the ones that they can transfer over and that they can talk about in their interviews and that kind of thing so i think the the employment support organizations that are that are in this virtual room uh, we see you guys as having a really key role in picking up and running with the skills builder framework so that you're helping your candidates into roles that employers with skills that employers have said that they're looking for 
for. So um, that was all I really wanted to say, but uh, just wanted to make that point. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, point very well made. I know in recent research we've um, we've just published um, a new ES ESRC project, Welfare at a Social Distance, and we did a YouGov survey um, of people who were claiming various benefits during COVID or uh, and looking and the kind of employment support they were looking for. So there were a huge amount of respondents who talked about um, self-identified need for support in, in looking for different jobs if they th if they thought that their job was not going to be available anymore or they'd be they'd be looking to to transfer to a different sector. So that's incredibly important. Um, Suzanne um, is there asking, is there a possibility for organisations? Thanks, Laura, for putting the link into to our report. Is there a possibility for organisations to have a walkthrough or trial of the system to see, to see how we could make this work, um, particularly for smaller organisations, non-profits um, as well? So, Adam, is there, is there a possibility of that? And I sense a lot of enthusiasm here on the call and people wanting to know what to do next, which is wonderful. Absolutely. We are, like I said, we are um very interested in people um i guess joining this effort to build help us build essential skills in everyone and so uh, my advice would be to you know take a look at the uh down uh toolkits that are available for download on our website um you can reach out directly to us also by send, sending us a message via the portal on our website and um i'm very happy to share my details uh also to anybody who's interested for follow-up conversation uh about how they can get involved that's awesome. Thanks, Adam. Wonderful. Um, and finally, moving to Katie and Porvi, I wondered whether there are any kind of f final calls to action, if you like, or just takeaways that you'd like to to leave um, to leave colleagues on the call with. Um, I actually had a question. Cause Katie, you said about Tideway, who are using it as part of their employee volunteering. I had some feedback from one of our companies at Team Heathrow to say, is there a way in which the enterprise advisors can be trained to use the framework with their partner schools? So whether with the career leader or with a group of students themselves, because we've got a network of Heathrow enterprise advisors and we were just thinking, is there a, a way in which we could be more proactive with the framework in schools? Yeah, I mean, Adam also um, step in, but um, obviously the Careers and Enterprise Company were part of the group of organisations that came together to take the Skills Builder framework from the amazing resource that it was in education into the universal framework and to test it with employers. So I think that there there should and could be an opportunity for us to link into the to the broader enterprise advisors. But yeah, that's a good um, action that Adam, we should probably look at taking up directly with CEC. Absolutely. Excellent, thank you. And um, Adam, are you happy to share your email address or contact uh, detail? Yeah. Absolutely, very happy to connect with anybody who would like to. This is a really exciting uh, point in our uh, history and really keen to connect with as many people as we can. Excellent, thank you. Um, just a final question, if I may, as chair, I know we're slightly uh, to time, but um, do you also, the, I know you work with a lot of large um, businesses, given the, the names that you put up there, but have you also been working with smaller and medium sized businesses or are you looking um, to work with, with them? Yeah, um, yep. So I guess both Adam and I can, can chat. So yes, business in the community predominantly is the larger organisations um, that you've seen, but we have through um, a cohort of um, companies we're calling the Trailblazers who are looking at the framework in employment that there, there are a number of smaller organisations. And from a BITC perspective, we will look at how we can partner predominantly through our existing members. So it'll be supply chain, etc. But Adam, I'm sure, can um, speak on behalf of Skills Builder. A similar experience here, very, uh, uh, very much going through that journey of connecting with smaller businesses to support them on this agenda. 
That's fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you all to Adam, Katie, Paul V and to everyone who's joined us. I think um, it's been a really stimulating discussion. I think a lot of useful information that I know colleagues will take forward. Um, and I know it um, historically, um, you know, the, the UK struggled with skills um, versus uh, other countries. So it is something that definitely we need to harness. And I think the key messages for me were really um, having that 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 simple language that accessibility for businesses and and making um as Paul V's very uh, very clearly outlined making um making the framework relevant to where you are and maybe testing different different bits of it as you go along so I think some some wonderful lessons there and really important that we share learning like this both um, amongst businesses and also amongst the the employability sector um, and look at where um you know we're kind of basically on the same page as essentially in helping people to um, to get into good quality employment and to stay in work and to to keep that sort of lifelong learning um, aspect alive I guess really that's something that really came through for me at the um, through the presentations today so thank you all so so much and I hope that this is a conversation with, that will continue and I'm sure it I'm sure it will be thank you thank you Thanks. Thanks. stay safe enjoy the rest of your week take care okay bye bye, bye.